all for coming out uh, this afternoon uh, to this 15th uh, Luzberg Lecture in Mission and Culture. I am indeed very grateful uh, to Father Stephen and for the committee that have selected me uh, with the honor and the invitation to deliver this 15th annual Luzberg Lecture. I am particularly honored to be invited uh, to honor the memory and the legacy of such a great priest and scholar. A priest and a scholar whom I admire greatly uh, because of the passion with which he engaged his scholarly work, but also with the restlessness with which he always thought and uh, tried to discover the most uh, relevant ways in which to express the incarnation of God's word in history. So thank you for uh, this opportunity and uh, uh, for me to be here again. This is my second time uh, to be at CTU. I'm always amazed at the energy, but also uh, the lively exchange at this uh, institution. So I look forward to uh, such a lively exchange and interaction. And uh, so since my lecture is uh, pretty uh, long, I thought that instead of reading it, perhaps I might just speak to it so that we can get a sense of what it is and then we can have interaction in the Q and, uh, uh, and A. But I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed with the passion with which uh, Father uh, Lusberg a thought that every scholarly achievement, every, every scholarly pursuit has to be in the view of exposing, of displaying the social material conditions that allowed for an authentic expression of Christian faith in the world. I think it is this restlessness and passion that led him not only to have an interest in science, but also in anthropology, and later on uh, to kind of become the pioneer of what has come to be known as missionary anthropology. He wrote, the Christian faith, whether in the third world or in one's own home parish, must be expressed in terms of nothing less than one's inmost self, one's inmost premises, basic attitudes and fundamental drives. Otherwise, Christianity is not authentic. The question of authentic exp experience and expression of Christian faith that lay at the heart of Father Luzbetak's scholarly project continues to be the most pressing theological and missiological question of our time, especially in Africa. However, whereas the quest has since the 1960s being dominated by the question of the relation of the Christian faith to African culture, we now find ourselves in a different context, a radically different context, in which the question of the authenticity of Christian faith in Africa must be placed within the context, within the context of political violence that threatens much of post-colonial Africa. In our time, the primary challenge facing the majority of Christians in Africa is not whether or how to relate one's faith to one's culture, but whether Christian faith can offer resources for peaceful coexistence in the context of widespread conflict and war. In the context of the endless cycles of violence in Africa, African Christians keep wondering does Christianity and Christian faith make any difference? What difference? I would like to argue this afternoon that Christianity does indeed make a difference, but for that difference to be felt and realized, Christian faith has to offer a radical interruption of the endless cycles of violence in Africa it has to be grounded within an explicit missiological vision of Ephesian communities and identities. 
the story of the 40 young students of Buta in Burundi provide the most illuminating case of what I want to say this afternoon. In the early hours of the morning in the fall of 1997, a militia group headed by a fierce woman commander attacked the seminary compound of Buta, a high school seminary in Burundi. They roused the students from their sleep and ordered the high school students to separate, Hutu on one side and Tusi on the other. Three times the order was given, but the students refused to separate. So the commander ordered the rebels to open fire. The students fell and others tried to escape. In all, 40 students were killed. One of the students who had been wounded ran to the rector's house and called for the rector to open the door for him. When the rector opened the door, the boy dashed inside the small house and gasping for breath told the rector, Father, we have won. They told us to separate and we refused. We have won. The student collapsed and died. My lecture this afternoon is about that we have won. For it is the logic of this odd winning and the practices that make it possible that missiological reflection must increasingly, increasingly be about in Africa given the context of political violence. What does it mean to win? My lecture proceeds in two parts. In the first part, I do so by reflecting uh, on the key scholarly insights from the 1994 Rwandan genocide, whose overall impact has been to press for new missiological and theological directions in African theological thinking. And in the second part, using the work of Andrew Walls, I propose a missiological framework within which the realities of political violence in Africa can be fruitfully engaged. Andrew Ward's work helps to show that the goal of mission is essentially political, namely the formation of Ephesian moments and communities whose identity supersedes ethnic tags and thus reflect the very height of Christ's full stature. Such Ephesian communities provide the most decisive interruption and alternative to the violent politics of race, ethnicity, and tribalism. The seminary at Buta in Burundi was such a community. And so by narrating the practices that formed the community of Buta, I will illumine the logic and practices through which the gospel shapes a culture of peace in Africa. You have heard it all. That's, that, that, that's, that's lecture. So let me just kind of, uh, <laughs> let me just kind of capture again the sense. In part one, what I'm trying to do is to kind of show that the Rwanda genocide that happened in 1994 not only changed the trajectory of my scholarly, uh, of my scholarship, it led me to see political violence as a unique political problem and a unique theological pro problem in Africa, and the kind of theological problem <coughs> that it is. It was 1994, I was in Belgium at the KU Leuven, just started my PhD in philosophy when the Rwanda genocide happened. And it kind of raised all sorts of questions in my mind. I was filled with shame, with anguish, with the disbelief of what I was seeing going on on the TV, with bodies everywhere. The first questions were really personal, questions about personal identity. My parents had migrated from Rwanda in the 1950s. I was born and raised in Uganda, and so I thought I was Ugandan. But I kept wondering, who am I? Am I Ugandan? Am I Rwandan? My parent, one was Hutu, the other Tusi. Was I Hutu? Was I Tusi? Questions of a personal nature in terms of a personal identity. But the Rwanda genocide also raised questions about Africa and my heritage as an African. How could we commit such atrocities? 
The genocide that is a very intimate affair, often carried out by machetes, neighbors killing other neighbors. How could people who shared so much in common kill one another with such a violent intensity? What about these quintessential African virtues that we often hear about of hospitality, of community and family? What Mbiti had popularized, I am because we are, and since we are, therefore I am. What happened to that virtue of Ubuntu? And then on the human level scale, when I saw, for example, the expatriates being withdrawn from Rwanda, therefore leaving all the innocent people to the murderous intensity of the entire army, I said, oh no. What happened about this thing called hum common humanity? Is there such a thing as common humanity? Or is this just kind of a platitude, one of those politically correct things to say, but that does not actually mean anything in reality? But perhaps the by far most uh, striking questions for me were questions related to my identity as a Christian and my identity as a priest, questions connected to what it means to be a Christian. That the genocide would happen in this overwhelming Christian country where most of the people were Christian, killing others, most of the time in the same churches. What kind of Christianity is this? Is the blood of tribalism deeper than the waters of baptism? And the, the, the genocide unfolded during Easter week when Christians are celebrating the resurrection. What does that show about Christ's power to overcome death? So many questions. On a scholarly level, Rwanda completely turned me upside down. <clears throat> First of all, there was a sense of utter uselessness and irrelevance of my studies. Here I was, a kind of very young, energetic student, just started on my PhD, and I'm reading all these beautiful figures like Hegel and Habermas and Heidegger. I'm really excited about that. And in the midst of that, a Rwanda genocide happens. And I could immediately see the utter irrelevance and uselessness of what I was doing in the context of uh, the genocide. And started raising nagging questions, not only about my own scholarship, but about scholarship in general. And I began to see that unless scholarship shed light on events like this, it becomes a kind of mystifying, but also distracting aspect of life. I was committed, if I could, use scholarship in a way to uh, expose and at least shed light on what was going on. It must have been this kind of conviction that in a way led me to shift my research focus. I was uh, going to do a purely uh, theoretical uh, dissertation on epistemology actually, that I moved actually the focus of my dissertation into political theory and began to search the power and the role of stories in the political imagination. But it was also, uh, now looking back, it must have also been the Rwanda genocide that led me actually to go and register for a master's in the theology department. For I wanted to get a sense of the logic of Christian ethics and what that kind of logic says to events like Rwanda. But since I finished my PhD in 1996, the Rwandan genocide had continued to be a part uh, of uh, the framework of my studies. I not only did the research, but traveled so many times, many times leading groups into Rwanda, uh, conducting workshops, and um, uh, published uh, uh, essays and books on, on, on Rwanda. So it has continued in a way to shape my scholarship. I won't go into all that, but let me just lift out three key insights that have emerged for me with such a clarity out of Rwanda. Three key insights that kind of press for new missiological directions. The first insight, that the Rwanda genocide was not an ethnic affair. Whatever this might be said, this was not ethnic warfare. This is political violence. The usual explanation, of course, we had when it was happening that these are ethnic groups or tribes, and this is the kind of playing out of age or animosities, people that have always hated each other and so forth. This, of course, is not true. Not only is Rwanda one of the most homogeneous countries, people speaking the same language, same culture, 
same history. The whole notion of tribe and ethnicity gets thrown out of the room when you begin to think about the Rwanda genocide. It was actually the work of a Ugandan scholar, Mahmoud Mamudani, that helped me to get a sense of what was going on. Mahmoud Mamudani, in a beautiful book, When Victims Become Killers, makes a crucial distinction between cultural and political identities. Cultural identities are the result of a shared history, people sharing the same history, the same language, the same culture. That kind of gives rise to cultural identities. Political identities are different. Political identities are formed and reinforced within the process of political formation. There's a whole section that I have in the paper that you can read, uh, the work of uh, Mamdan, but I think that is a key distinction. Most of the time we kind of confuse cultural identity and political identities. I began to see that what had happened in Rwanda was actually whatever role these notions of Hutu and Tusi might have played in pre-colonial Rwanda, they had become the building block of the modern Rwanda, colonial Rwanda and post-independent Rwanda. They had been transformed into political identities. So that by the time we come to 1994, even though people spoke the same language, lived together on the same hills, intermarried, so culturally homogeneous, the two communities of Hutu and Tusi had become exclusive political community. The key word here is political community. That it is within the formation and within the work of political imagination that these notions and identities get formed and reinforced. I know we can talk more about that uh, during the Q&A, but let me just kind of highlight the distinction was important for me that what is going on is not cultural warfare, it is political violence. And this is important because we see that Rwanda is not unique. In a number of African countries, these so-called ethnic upheavals are everywhere. And we make, a diff we make a mistake by saying, oh, it's the cultures, oh, it is these old age old uh, tribes fighting each other. What is going on is actually a unique form of political violence that is happening. The second insight, key insight that emerged out of this engagement, a clear insight, was what literal difference Christianity made in Rwanda. The fact that Christianity was woven throughout the cultural, social, political, economic landscape of Rwanda meant very little when it came to 1994. That Christianity was not able to provide any bulwark against the murderous intensity of these so-called ethnic uh, rivalries is actually quite striking. And again, go into a long section about uh, what happened. Uh, key to that is that Christian mission from the very start never sought to provide an alternative imagination of Rwanda. It simply built on what was available within the colonial anthropology and imagination. Christianity never thought to provide an alternative, also a way of reconfiguring these identities in view of a unique Christian anthropology. And part of the reason is, again, there is a long section here, part of the reason is the background to mission, the 19th century mission, missionaries in the 19th century who were very well educated and coming out of um, European enlightenment, who operated within that neo-scholastic <coughs> distinction between nature and grace. And Christianity and Christian mission was within the, the realm of, 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 of grace. Therefore, leaving the realm of nature to the realm of, of politics. And Christianity uh, never thought that its own um, competence lay at all in all providing alternative configuration of whatever had become natural, in this case, the so-called uh, tribal 
ethnical or racial identities. The third clear insight that emerged, uh, that emerged out of my ongoing research for Rwanda was that Rwanda was not and is not unique. Rwanda just provides a kind of radicalization of what is a regular feature within many African countries. That a number of African, the same dynamics as in Rwanda are going on, whether it is in terms of the so-called ethnic uh, rivalries and outbreaks, or in terms of the impotence, if you like, of Christianity to do anything to interrupt that violence. A lot of cases, the Congo Wars, from 1996 to 2003, especially that intense time, especially during the so-called Second Kong War. Over 3.3 million people killed just within, from 96 to 2003, in what the International Rescue Committee has called the most deadly war ever documented on African soil with the highest death toll anywhere in the world since World War II. Most of that war focused in the Ituri uh, region where the two big tribes, the Hema and Lendu, carried out massacres on either side. The fact that the majority of the people on either side were Christian didn't seem to make much difference. More recently, the Central African Republic, most of Central African Republic, 4.5 million people are Christians. In 2013, violence breaks out. These uh, Serika rebels, mostly Muslims, uh, top of the government and the, uh, put in power in a, in a new president and start carrying out massacres. And then in September 2013, anti-Baraka uh, movements, mostly made up of Christians, Catholics especially, form to fight um, the Serika rebels. And the massacres that have been going on, uh, over 3,000 people, with international media warning a possible genocide. The fact that the anti-Balaka um, uh, uh, defense groups are Christian doesn't seem to make much difference. More recently, South Sudan, another case. Uh, the president of South, South Sudan, Sudan firing his prime minister, uh, he, sorry, his, 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 his dep deputy, and then a civil war uh, erupts. And the, the war, the civil war, unsurprisingly, immediately turned into a tribal war between the Dinka and the Norway. Over 10,000 people displaced, a number of people killed, <coughs> Um, and reports warn of genocide. From a scholarly point of view, there are so many social, historical, geopolitical factors that can explain each of these complex conflicts. What, however, cannot be denied is the readiness with which political conflict in Africa generates into ethnic conflict. Elsewhere, I have argued that the notions of ethnicity and tribe are wired within the imaginative landscape of modern Africa, thus making ethnic conflict not only a perpetual feature of post-colonial Africa, but ethnicity as an enduring and readily available tool for political mobilization. But what I hope this brief analysis makes clear are that these ethnic wars are really not wars about ethnic differences. They are not wars about cultural differences. They are about a struggle for power into which ethnicity easily gets invoked and reproduced. But this is what presses missiological questions and theological questions. What difference does Christianity make within such a complexity of political violence that has so many layers built within it. Does Christianity make any difference? So it is this, this kind of question, this kind of insights that led me to seek new missiological and theological directions, really convinced that for theology and, and for, for, for Christianity uh, 
and, and missiology to make a, an impact or to, to, to provide a way forward, it would have to assume a new and a fresh starting point. A point does not, that does not assume ethnic or cultural identity as the unquestionable point of reference for mission. New missiological uh, frameworks. I didn't know where to begin. I'm not a missiologist. I'm not even a theologian. I'm trying to become a theologian. I'm just a recovering philosopher. So I, I didn't. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know where to begin in thinking about these issues missiologically and theologically. However, there were cases within the Rwanda genocide that kept haunting me and kept coming back to my mind and seems to be po pointing to the direction that theological and missiological reflection needed to go. The first case was the case of the Muslim community. In contrast to the mass participation of Christians in the genocide, the Muslim community did not participate by and large in the genocide. That is surprising. Prunier gives as a possible reason why the Muslims didn't participate is their strong sense of solidarity that goes beyond ethnic tags. This solidarity, he writes, comes from the fact that being Muslim in Rwanda, where Muslims are a very small proportion, 0.2%, is not simply a choice dictated by religion. It is a global identity choice. Muslims are often marginal people, and this reinforces a strong sense of community identification which supersedes ethnic tags, something the majority of Christians have not been able to achieve. Solidarity that supersedes ethnic tags. I kept thinking, this is what Christian mission ought to be about. The formation of community whose identity and solidarity supersedes ethnic tags. The second case that kept, uh, that kept haunting me was a case of um, a story of a Hutu boy with a confused identity. This boy fled to the bush during the genocide and after two or three weeks, the Tusi pointed out to him that he was Hutu, and so he could be saved. He left the marshes and was not attacked. But this mixed up boy had spent so much time with the Tusis in his early childhood that he was confused. He did not know how to draw the proper line between Hutu and Tusi. Afterwards, when he returned to the village, he did not get involved in the killing. The Interahamwe did not force him to kill because, in their words, he was clearly overwhelmed. I found the case of this boy, confused identity, extremely fascinating. For in his confusion, he embodies the kind of anthropological naivety that points to the possibility of an identity and a community that supersedes ethnic tags. And just like the Muslim community, the confused boy provides a fresh interruption to and an alternative to the madness of ethnicity during the genocide. I was interested to explore the theological and missiological foundations of such a cases. Again, I didn't know where to go until I read the work of the missiologist Andrew Walls. Andrew Walls, and I. Uh, Mostly writes essays myself. In 1982 essay, The Gospel as a Prisoner and Liberator of Culture, he notes that church history has always been a battleground for two opposing tendencies, each of which has its origin in the gospel, the indigenizing and the pilgrimage principles, respectively. While the indigenizing principle means that one cannot totally separate oneself from one's culture, the pilgrimage principle points to the gospel as a dynamic process that takes one out of one's culture. Now, the fact that these two principles uh, exist together leads to a creative tension within the life of the Christian. For where the indigenizing principle means that to live as a Christian is to live as a member of a particular society, community, tribe, or nation, the pilgrimage principle point to the constant identity crisis that mission creates as it invites the Christian always to live between 
and beyond the boundaries of one's race, culture, tribe, and nation. Now, this has far-reaching political implications. Andrew, of course, does not explore these political um, implications in this essay, even though he nods that in the pilgrimage principle, God takes people out of their particular culture in order to transform them into what he wants them to be. He does not tell us what that is. But if you read, read this in connection with another essay by Andrew Wars, you get the full political import of what he's talking about. The essay I'm referring to is the Ephesian moments of world Christianity, where Andrew Wall notes that the coming together of two committees historically separated, the breaking down of the wall of separation brought about by Christ's death, is what Paul celebrates in the letter to the Ephesians. Jewish and Gentile Christians, Paul writes, are no longer strangers and sojourners, but fellow citizens and members of God's household. And so, if the letter to the Ephesians recognizes that the cultural and political realities of being Jew and Gentile are there, this is not what Paul celebrates. But what he celebrates is the fact of their coming together, of their being made alive together, of their being raised up together, of their sitting together. In the Ephesians, all these phrases come up one after another. Being raised together, sitting together, made alive together in the letter to the Ephesians. That is what Paul celebrates. Jewish and Gentile Christians belong together as bricks used in the construction of a single building, the temple where God uh, lives. They do not constitute two separate communities, but one community of which they are both members, constituting, as it were, different parts of a single body of which Christ is the head, mind, and brain, under whose control the whole body works and is held together. Ephesians 4, 15 to 16. Now, a number of things become clear from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. First, that the coming together, or being made alive together, raised up together, sitting together. The coming together of these different cultural elements is what reveals the very height of Christ's full stature. The very height of Christ's full stature is reached only by the coming together of the different cultural entities into the body of Christ. They belong together as one of them is incomplete without the other. Only together, not on our own, can we reach this full stature, end of quote from wars. Secondly, what the above description point to is the fact that the coming together of the different cultural elements creates something new, something odd, something unique, a new people, a new community, neither Jewish nor Gentile. Something is similar of what happened at Antioch when the people didn't know what to call this new group, and therefore they called them Christian. Thirdly, as war notes, the expression and test of that coming together was the meal table, the eating together. Two cultures that were historically divided began to eat together. And therefore, the meal table, the institution that had once symbolized the eth ethnic and cultural division, now became the hallmark of Christian living. Thus, the expression of this new identity and new community, this new Ephesian community, is not something spiritual. That means that kind of wafts above the everyday. It is actually very, very mundane and kind of worked out in the very concrete and tangible aspects of everyday life very concrete practices of everyday life. Now, this is what brings us back to the story of Buddha. Because Buddha provides such a, a unique illumination of an Ephesian community that was, in a way, built in the very concrete practices of everyday life. And so thinking about some of those practices might help us to get a sense of the kind of practices that the gospel generates, inspires, 
as it shapes the culture of peace in Africa. Now, the attack on Buddha that I referred to earlier on has to be placed within the broader context of the social history of Burundi, within which ethnicity became the key building block, not unlike Rwanda, not unlike many African countries. A German quarantine in 1919, Burundi came under the Belgian rule and using the same hemitic mythology actually created a society that was neatly divided between Hutu, Tusi, and Tua identities. And the colonialists, of course, affirmed Tusi privilege while they're setting up a system of political and economic administration that marginalized the majority Hutu. But unlike Rwanda to the north, Burundi's independence in 1964 left the Tusi in power, but the ethnic line was never altered. It just has continued to shape the post-independence politics of Rwanda, leading to a number of series of coup d'etat, massacres that have pitted Tusi against Hutu in an endless cycle of revenge and counter-revenge. The fact that 80% of Burundi's 10 million people are Christian seems to make very little difference in this political violence of ethnicity. Now, following the assassination of President Merkel Ndandaye, the first Hutu president in 1993, the Hutus began to avenge their foreign president by killing Tusi neighbors. A devastating civil war ensued as extremists on both sides carried out massacres in villages, on the hills and schools and institutions. A number of schools closed. In fact, by 1997, as ethnic tension mounted, Buta was the only, one of the few schools that remained open, but definitely the only school where both ethnicities, Hutu and Tusi, lived together and continued to study as normally as possible. This is surprising, and we begin to ask why. This was, of course, in great part due to the leadership of the rector, Father Zachary Bukuru, who not only encouraged the students to remain at school, but who, through a number of programs, formed the students into a rare community whose sense of identification and solidarity superseded <coughs> ethnic tags. I quickly, I run through some of the programs. The first of this program involved what uh, Bukuru says was a, a determined reading, rereading of Burundi's history. In this case, he was surprised that when the assassination of the president happened, this community that he thought would live together, they reverted quickly back to the old ethnic prejudices of what they knew about the other as killers, as enemies, and so forth. So in the wake of this, the rector determined that he had to reread, he had to engage the difficult and yet necessary rereading of history. And so every evening, he would gather the seminarians and retell the history of Burundi, showing how actually within that history there were no clear victims and no clear perpetrators. They were both. But because each one of them had a story in which they appeared to be the victims and the other the perpetrators. The reading was to show that actually both are victims and perpetrators. And in fact, he even led them to see that even though the majority of Burundians were impoverished and it made little difference whether the president was Hutu or Tusi, the role of the ethnicity within this political configuration was actually to distract from the real concrete issues that were facing Burundian society. The second program that uh, the rector introduced was a, uh, a, a, a session on dialogue. And this, for Father Bukuru, was uh, to target, uh, uh, to, uh, to wage, sorry, a merciless war on lies and rumors, which were the source of much fear and anxiety in the community. One way he did this was to, devel to devote the second part of the nightly meetings to dialogues, an open forum for students to ask questions and voice their fears and anxieties. Now, during this dialogue time, students were encouraged to retell the rumors they had heard, and these were openly discussed. Shy students were encouraged to write their comments down ahead of time 
to make sure that everybody got a chance. The dialogues also provided an opportunity for students to name the prejudices against each ethnic group as a way to take the sting out of the verbal violence of the prejudices. The overall effect of these nightly forums was a culture of truth, truth-telling, and trust that began to form within the student community. As the evening meetings and forums went on, the students debated all political issues, taking care to name them and to seek their origins without trying to hide anything. As a result, quote, there was no need to dream of taking up arms like other youth in the country in order to find justice. This dialogue gave us relief. It healed us, end of quote. The third uh, practice was communal work and recreation. And Father Bukuru writes, we welcomed everything that might promote laughter and relaxation between the two ethnic groups, sporting competitions, matches between the groups, between the students and teachers, between seniors and juniors, cross-country races, manual labor, anything that offered a chance to sing together, games, theater, dance, lectures, uh, festive meals, were all shared and teachers and students together. All these things changed the face of the seminary, end of quote. Now, dance played a particularly significant role in healing, but also in cementing the unity between the ethnic groups. The, Kirin, the Kirundi traditional dance in particular, which both groups shared and enjoyed, called us, I quote again, called us beyond ourselves into generosity, joy, relaxation, sharing, dialogue, and purity, and brought us together in a single culture, uniting us in something beyond our differences in ethnicity, age, or social status, end of quote. In fact, dance became another form of prayer. And so on weekends, the, semin the seminary alternated between dance, song, and night prayers. Now through these and many other activities, the boys were so filled with a spirit of fraternity that they began to create their own clubs and associations, including a local chapter of Music for Hope International, environmental clubs. They formed a, a, an association of AIDS awareness through which they organized lectures at the seminary, but also outreach in the local communities. Now, though these and other activities, through, the, sorry, through these and other activities, the reputation of Buddha as a unique and rare example of solidarity that exceeded ethnic uh, ethnicity spread in the country. And while this reputation, reputation, reputation earned them admiration, for example, the prime minister visited and gave them a cow, it also earned them enemies from either side of the ethnic divide who regarded them as traitors. It is perhaps not surprising that among those who attacked the seminary were three former students who had left because they had found the idea of unity not only impossible, but dangerous. I conclude. The story of Buddha offers a number of key lessons in thinking about Christianity and the prospects of peace in the context of political violence in Africa. First, building a community whose solidarity exceeds ethnic tags is not simply an aspect it is the essential dimension, indeed the heart of the gospel. In telling the story of Buddha, through which a culture of solidarity came to take shape, Father Bukuru notes that the cent there was a central role that prayer and worship and other spiritual activities did. In fact, these activities served both as the glue and the spring that replenished our strength to live in unity together. What this essential spiritual dimension meant is that unity was more of a grace from God than the fruit of our own effort, end of what. Two, we have taken time to narrate these activities and disciplines in order to highlight the work, the effort, and the time that is required to build an Ephesian community marked by trust and solidarity among ethnic groups. In the case of Buta, it took the determined effort of the rector and the staff 
to build these practices into the rhythm and way of life of the community. Three, within the social history of Burundi, characterized by ethnic rivalry and violence, Buta provides a much needed fresh interruption, an alternative, and confirms the possibility of another way of living together, of another history, another anthropology, another politics. But the death of the 40 young seminarians who lost their lives also confirms how dangerous such an interruption is. In fact, it takes courage. But also the martyrdom of these 40 young men confirms that living within Ephesian communities or the, or the existence of Ephesian communities like a Buddha does not promise to make the world any safer because there are those who will always be willing to kill in order to advance a politics based on lies and violence. And finally, without the story and witness of communities like a Buddha, the full height of Christ's full stature remains simply an idea, a theory, but not a concrete political alternative that it is meant to be. For it is communities like a Buddha that both reveal and confirm the truth of the gospel, namely that Christ has broken down the wall of separation and that we are no longer strangers and sojourners but fellow citizens and members of God's household. I think that is the winning that the boy who had been wounded was referring to when he collapsed before the rector after telling him, Father, we have won. They told us to separate and we, have ref and we refused. We won. In the context of Africa's ongoing cycles of political violence, we need many more of such a stories of winning. Thank you. Emmanuel, thank you so much. Uh, this was um, inspiring, but more than inspiring, it was amazingly challenging. And I think that we're all um, just really inspired and challenged to uh, take um, our understanding of culture and cultural identity and so forth to a, to a new level. Uh, so thank you really so much for this. It was just uh, uh, amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we have, oh, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. We'll, we'll go over a little time since we started a, a little bit late. But in all these official greetings and all. But, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, I, I, would, uh, I would certainly invite you, if it's OK, Emmanuel. Uh, oh, no, 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 that's so, yeah, that's a question. I'm sorry, I went too long. I wanted more time for oh, our no, conversation. You, yeah. you, you were mesmerizing. <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> uh, so um, if, um, if anybody would like to ask a, a question, please feel free. And here's the microphone. I'll, uh, I'll run around and, and uh, correct you. There you Oh, OK. Thank you. OK. Thank you. I wonder if uh, there might be any other examples of uh, community coming together uh, beyond the record and, and how what's happened in, in other instances. Yes, uh, there are quite a number of other communities like that. Uh, this was a high school seminar. So these are young students, high school students. In Africa, they call them seminaries. I don't think you still have that institution here of those high school, <coughs> a few, a couple, yeah. A, a, a couple, yeah. So these are still uh, yeah, 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 young students. Yeah, but there is, for example, the community at Nyange of the students, again, uh, that uh, were ordered to, to separate, who refused. Uh, this is a high school again. Uh, and the number of students were killed. Uh, seven students lost their lives, um, including a girl who is buried just behind the school there, uh, whose name is Shanta Mujawa Mahoro. Uh, and Mujawa Mahoro in Kinyarwanda means maiden of peace. 
uh, who is just here. Yeah. So, so there are a number of other, other commentaries that remain that uh, this, this is not a rectory, but this of course was a high school, and of course there is the rector and uh, uh, does all of that. But there are a number of other uh, communities that I increasingly refer to as Ephesian communities that I kind of point in the direction of what I think uh, the politics of the gospel is about. That the gospel is not a politically neutral uh, invitation. Mission is not politically neutral. Its goal is to form these kind of new communities that are, yeah, Ephesian. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. My question concerns with the prevention of future capacities such as in uh, Rwanda. Uh, what are some of the signs from other uh, 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 genocide that you know that could lead to potential uh, ge uh, genocide, right? Maybe the genocide that's happening now or maybe in the future that you can prevent. Well, you, you know, there's a whole uh, range of studies now as a uh, kind of uh, pre-genocide warning that kind of uh, predict signs, uh, factors that could, uh, in a way, lead to genocide at the Kroc Institute, for example, international peace studies are, are, are not really... There's, a, there's a, a number of professors who are working in this kind of uh, warning signs of what uh, genocide might might happen. One, I think uh, clearly, uh, here I talked about the politics of lies. Politics of lies in a way that uh, kind of forms identities, these identities, exclusive identities. You are either this or the other. That is a politics of lies because we are neither either or. All of us, in a way, have so many stories that kind of form our identities. Uh, but politics, at times, comes to kind of make a sense that you either here or there. I, I think once you see a radicalized politics of such a uh, exclusive belonging, I, I, I would start to get to get to get worried. Uh, interest, uh, entre, uh, entre dictatorships with no political outlet. That's what happens in most of these African countries now. A number of African countries, for example, have instituted uh, the, the politics of no term limits. Even those countries that had clear term limits for the president, uh, including my own Uganda, began processes where, first of all, they called for a third term for the president, but eventually it turned into endless terms, no, no limit. So that there is no kind of outlet, there is no, 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 no future projection of what is going to happen. So people increasingly live under frustration, context and an atmosphere of political frustration which there seem to be no outlet or no, or, or no sense of when things are going to change. And what that happens, especially in Africa, you see more of that kind of radicalization that immediately, in a way, recruit, if you like, ethnicity into the picture. And once it looks ethnicity into the picture, then it becomes us against them. Then, uh, in a way, our energies and our attention is directed away from the real issue, then it turns to the non-issue. And what happens, just as the case in Rwanda, we end up killing the very people that we love, neighbors killing neighbors. Uh, th that's what happened. That's the madness of politics in Africa, in a way. It is a political issue, it is a political problem. Uh, it is misleading to just refer it as ethnic, ethnic warfare, because that gives an impression Oh, this is the kind of thing that these African tribes do now and again when they don't have anything to do for entertainment. That, that, that's not the case. This is a very, very, very difficult um, political issue that needs to be solved politically. But then ethnicity becomes mystifying, not only mystifying for, for us who are involved in it because then it kind of directs the attention away from the real issue, but mystifying for the West. Because the West likes to hear that, oh, yeah, those ethnic warfares. And that seems to explain, that seems to absolve any, in a way, responsibility. So then kind of, yeah, but, but uh, you, you, you're right, I think you start to say, so what are the warning signs that must be detected in, uh, to, to prevent genocide? I think it's a political process. Uh, the clearer the political process is, uh, the more transparent, uh, the, 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 the more uh, the usual uh, di dimensions of uh, political dialogue and engagement and uh, uh, compromise, the less that is going to turn into this. But also political education. For people to know that the real issue, for example, in Burundi, in Rwanda, in Africa, all that, that, that these people killing one another. It's not that they have anything really wrong. Again. 
it's a distraction away from the real political issues of existence. Thank you, Father. Yes. I, I was just wondering whether what happened in Rwanda I, that you're telling us has any other link to what is happening in other parts of Africa and in the Western world, in the Arab world. And again, you, you almost answered my question, but I was still asking about the responsibility of the West. Because you said it's political conflict and not cultural, not uh, ethnicity. What role has the West? Because African politics, as we have it today, came from our colonizers. So, what role have they played in all this kind of problem? And what are they really doing to help us to grow out of the kind of politics that we are doing? Well, you know, the second, uh, to, to, to speak to the second part of the question, that's where I am discouraged. Uh, even the, the framing of the question at times, okay, what role does the West have? There is a way in which that question is asked, in which we are always looking to the West to solve these problems. Uh, and I don't like it. I think it's the way things are, but I, 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 I don't like it. Uh, but I know the power that that does in terms of uh, Africa, for example. We keep looking to the West. Part of it is a colonial legacy. Oh, the, the West will do this. The West will, uh, will not allow Museven to stand again. The, <laughs> of course, it does not. That, that's not. That's not true. So in a way, it kind of shifts the responsibility from us. So I would like, well, first of all, to call the responsibility back to us who are involved in it. Yes, the West might be, but the West is coming, and that's the second. The West coming is not a kind of a neutral coming. The West also has its own agenda. And to imagine that the West will have an agenda or that because we call hu humanitarian or human community, to, to think that, oh yeah, that, that is strong enough to, to, to really set up, uh, sort of or head up in Africa's problems. For me, all these kind of assumptions and good feeling were thrown overboard in 1994 uh, to kind of say, oh, yeah, we have to depend on the West, we have to wait for them. Because there was a clear sense of the never again. Uh, and there it is happening for our eyes and so, dear darling, oh, no, it's not genocide. Some aspects of the genocide might have happened, but it's not really genocide, it's certain, and so forth and so on. So I wouldn't depend, depend so much on that. But, and, 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 and Maybe that's the nature of politics. The West is self-interested. The, the nature of politics is self-interest. That is the politics that he is at that one. I think we, 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 we are not doing a service to ourselves to think that the West is going to operate out of a different logic than the self-interest. But, and this is the, the, the key back, but for me, my audience is not the West. My audience are Christians. Whether Christians happen to be in the West or in Africa, and so, I feel there is something deeply that we share about this Ephesian core that actually should begin to challenge us. The problem is that when we Christians get so much locked within the imagination of the nations, our nations, that this is a clear case of Rwanda, that mission work was clearly located within that imagination and never for once thought that it was possible to interrupt it or question it. But is Rwanda unique? No. That's some Christianity that actually is in the West. I wrote a small book, uh, Mira to the Church, precisely for that, for that argument. That we might look at Rwanda as unique and so forth. But there is something about Christianity in a way that we have come to embody in our time, West, uh, that, that, that is so clearly wedded, if you like, to the imaginative landscape of nation states. And we think that that is a good thing. But if you understand the, the logic of nation states as independent actors, as self-interested entities, they are going always to pursue self-interest. It's not only the West, but nation states as nation states. And I make the argument that even small nation states like Rwanda, if it is given the resources, it would like to have the soul of America it would be equally aggressive. You can already see it in Rwanda in terms of its aggression in Congo. So nation states are born, seems to me, with a soul of self-interest. 
So in order to, for us to always to think of the Western nation and we think about Capitol Hill, uh, Washington, Obama, I, I, I don't know. I, I, but the church and Christians who stand within the same story, whether it is in Rwanda or in Uganda or in Liberia or in America, that we read this same Ephesian letter, what is that showing to us? So for me, that's where the ground, that's the audience that I feel that we need to do constructive social ethic or constructive missiological thinking rather than the West or the nation. Does that not mean that we have nothing to say to the nation? No, of course no. But to have that as a primary audience uh, expectation, I, I, I feel it will be a kind of misplaced expectation as far as I'm concerned. One more question. Thank you, Dr. Manuel. I'm interested because you talk about Rwanda and Rwanda. Uh, yeah. I want to, to share with the, the story the power, the power of political narratives. It's what it shared for me. When it happened in genocide, I was 13. Yes, all the lost brothers, sisters, parents. Me too, it it's took me a long time to think about Christianity. When I, it happened in genocide, foreign countries, they send a plane, their planes, to pick up all the foreigners. It was killed, military shooting. Then the foreigners, with the United Nations troop and the French and the Belgian troop came to pick up all foreigners to go to, to move out from Rwanda to go to, to go back to their countries. I have uh, I was around. There is a nun. She was taking care for orphan children. She needed. To, she has so many children. She so around three 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 hundred children. She needed, she said, maybe I have 300 children, I would like to go with the two. She tried to, to come with the two children, to go with them. The military refused. They said, you are not allowed to go with those children. She cried, then she, she said, you can go, I can stay with my kids. That that's was also a story, how the Christianity, she showed it to risk her life with their children, rather than to live, to live to them. Yeah. We have another story for Sister Fel Felicita. Yeah. Sister Felicita, she has her brother was um, colonel in the military troop in the regime. Her brother wrote to her, his, uh, his brother wrote to her, I said, my sister, I love you so much. You are taking the care for those people. But make sure we come in two weeks to destroy all your compound and to kill all the people you are within. So make sure you have to leave and come. Then she wrote to her brother. She said, my brother, I love you so much. But the people I am staying with are brothers and sisters, are human beings. I prefer to die with them than to live from them. It's also witness for Christianity. Uh, but me too, when I was, yeah. when genocide happened after genocide, my, my formation in the seminary, I was thinking, how to become a Christian? All the time I was asking God, why, how, what happened? It's a question when it's happened in horrible thing. We ask God, why? Where are you? Why can you allow this to be? So, but I realized that the, the power of evil, the power of evil, the, 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 the Christian sometimes, even here is seen, we need to be religious than to be human. That's the challenge for the day. We need to be religious. We want to be a priest. But are you human? 
we need it to be, it's not in Rwanda, it's even here. When I go somewhere in the neighborhood, as a black priest, the people will say, ah, this is black. Maybe he's a chief. Maybe he's a gang member. Maybe he's selling drugs. Because I'm, drug, I'm black. It's because of the narratives and the power of lying. Because the narratives, strong narratives and lying, black is a gang member, black is a stupid guy, black is selling drugs. Because of narratives. That's Genocide cannot happen in one day or, or in one week. It takes time through narratives and writing stories. So we need to be religious and to be human. So what happened in Rwanda? You enjoy to be baptized, to be confirmed, to be a priest, to be a nun, but you are not human. Be first human, then you will become after religion. Yes. Just to say thank you, Didas. Let's say, yeah, what can you add on that? I think, yeah, be human. I think this is your, this is your message. And uh, thank you so much, Emmanuel. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.